Hello and welcome to this episode of Paleocast. I'm Laura Sol, and it's just me today as Dave is busy working on the Virtual Natural History Museum. In this episode, I'm talking to David Bapst about graptolites and macroevolutionary patterns. Graptolites are colonial organisms that are almost all extinct. I definitely recommend taking a look at the pictures on our website for this one. David has sent us some really beautiful images, including some stereograms which work like magic eye pictures, so they should look 3D if you can kind of relax your eyes the right way. Right at the start of this interview, we discussed the evolutionary relationships between graptolites and other groups. Um, so we've also got some diagrams of those evolutionary trees, which should help kind of understanding what's going on. We actually recorded this episode at GSA, a conference you've heard us report from before. It's the Geological Society of America's annual conference. There were loads of great paleontology talks this time around, and David, who I'm talking to, was actually an organiser for one of those sessions. We do have another conference coming up at the end of this month, again one that we often report from for you. Uh, this is SVP, so the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology annual meeting, and Liz and Caitlin are going to be there. They'll be recording loads of things with the speakers and the presenters at the poster sessions, as well as some full episodes. So make sure that you check back in with us to hear all about the latest research on vertebrate fossils. But for now, here's me and Dave discussing the graptolites. to David Bapst, who is a postdoctoral scholar at UC Davis and an adjunct assistant professor at the South Dakota School of Mines. Hi, David. Hi. So I'll ask the first question that we often ask people, which is, how did you first become interested in paleontology? Oh, uh, well, I first became interested in paleontology uh, at around the age of two when I had a birthday cake that um, was falling apart, so my grandmother decided to uh, put dinosaur toys all over it in order to try to hold it together, in which case it looked just like a melting volcano covered in dinosaurs. Um, and uh, I have loved extinct organisms ever since. So I suppose like many people, dinosaurs were yeah, your first yeah, paleontology Yeah, but look. I also grew up on Devonian shells, and uh, I would... Uh, commonly go to the public library and look at books about fossils and then go uh, back behind the uh, local fire hall where there was some nice shale outcrops and collect brachiopods and trilobites. So how did you transfer that first interest in paleontology into your career now? Well, I, I knew that I wanted to be interested in geology and earth science and, and um, as a, I mean, even from when I was seven, I was reading about like how long a PhD in paleontology would take and like would tell people at like family reunions. And um, so all through high school and going into college, I knew I wanted to do geology because that was the best sort of starting point for the sort of paleontology I wanted to do. And that I wanted to do a good mix of biology in there too. Um, I ended up in an undergrad at least doing a lot less biology than I expected to, um, which is you know just dependent on what sort of school you go to and what sort of biology programs they have. Um, but uh, as a geology student, I ended up getting involved as a researcher in a lab where they were studying graptolites, and that's how the story begins, really. <laughs> um, so you said you study graptolites. We should definitely start with um, you explaining to us what, what a graptolite is. Okay. Well, uh, a graptolite is a group of colonial organisms that belong to the phylum Hemichordata, and the Hemichordata are most closely related to echinoderms, and together they form a group called the Ambulacarans, which are basically one big uh, section of the deuterostomes, which we belong to. But they have a great fossil record in the Paleozoic, and some of them are still alive today. Okay, so they're things that have been around for a very, very long time, but mm -hmm. they are still alive today. What are the living ones like? There's a, there's a few species. Um, they all belong to the the genus Rhabdoplura. Um, they are very, very small. Uh, they're colonial organisms. That means that each organism is composed of multiple individuals. We call those individuals zooids. Those zooids actually construct their homes. They construct these tubes, and these tubes are connected to each other, and that's one of the defining traits of it being graptolites, actually. Um, and 
uh, these little zooids and their little connected tubes live on the bottom of the seafloor. For example, um, they're commonly found off of Plymouth, um, and they'll generally have their little colonies formed on the um, upturned side of a lamellibranchia. So what does it mean that it's a colonial organism? Well, colonial organisms mean that each genetic individual is actually composed of multiple bodies, essentially. That um, we have multiple individuals, they all share the same DNA, they're all clones of each other, they've sort of butted off of each other. Um, in some colonial organisms, some of the individuals might have different tasks or roles, and those have different morphologies, but they're essentially all the same um, genetic individuals. And in this particular case, they are all uh, linked together, still anatomically. They all have a, a stolon that they're connected to, and if a zooid dies, this stolon can actually regenerate a new zooid off of it. So in the case of graptolites, are all the zooids the same as each other, or are they differentiated? In the case of graptolites, uh, all of the living ones, the zooids, are pretty much identical to each other. They only differ in morphology if some of them go into sort of a resting stage, in which case they sort of degenerate. Okay. What are some other examples that people might know of colonial organisms? Uh, well, the other colonial organisms are corals. In that case, uh, the individuals all tend to be the same. Um, another case are bryozoans. Bryozoans actually, sometimes all the individuals look the same and sometimes they can be very different. They can have specialized zooids for just um, removing uh, little predators crawling along the colony and such. So you said that uh, Raptopleura, the living Graptolite, now that's a benthic organism, so it, it just lives mm -hmm. on the seafloor, yeah. it doesn't move. Um, how does it feed and reproduce and everything? Well, each zooid, um, it, each zooid basically looks like a little teardrop with two little uh, arms coming off of it that look like wings. And these little arms, they stick them up into the seawater and they have ciliary bands on them that allows them to suspension feed from the water around them, um, pulling out little bits of phytoplankton and such from the water. And they're uh, very low metabolism creatures and so they don't actually take much nutrients from the water. So do we know how the extinct graptolites kind of fed and reproduced? Did they do the sim similar things? Well, unfortunately with the fossil graptolites we have a very, very small number of fossils that are purported to have preserved zooids um, or to show anything that might be a zooid. We know very little about what the morphology might be. We have some inferences because Rhabdopleura, the genus that's around today, is actually very similar to the earliest graptolites that first show up in the Cambrian. Um, and so we think we have a good idea of what sort of the stem basal morphology is based upon uh, Rhabdopleura. And so we try to make inferences then based and, and, and cross that to the other graptolites. Now, there's a little bit of complexity here. There's actually another group of colonial hemichordates that are most closely related to the graptolites. They all belong today to the genus Cephalodiscus. Um, and together they form a group that's called the Terebrinx. Now Cephalodiscus is actually pseudo-colonial. They bought off of each other, but they don't actually stay connected biologically. And they form tubes which aren't actually connected to each other. And so we can distinguish between colonies that would be similar to what we call Raptopleura today and colonies that we would say are similar to Cephalodiscus today, and we can find those going all the way back to the Cambrian. Okay, so you can kind of compare what you see in the fossil record to those two groups. Uh-huh, and, and so the, um, and recent cladistic analyses, this is why I say graptolites are extant, ended up moving what we call graptolites and have called graptolites for centuries now into the group that includes this genus Raptopleura. And that allows us to see that Raptopleura basically is an extant graptolite. So before that, did we, we used to think that they were all extinct? Yeah, we used to think that they were all extinct and that Cephalodiscus and, and Raptopleura belonged to this group called Terebranchs, and the actual relationships of graptolites within the Terebranchs was sort of unclear. In fact, back in the 90s, there were some claims that Cephalodiscus was the most closely related uh, group of Terebranchs to graptolites, and that's been clarified recently um, with a paper in Lathea from Mitchell et al. in 2009. Did the extinct graptolites also live on the uh, seafloor, or did they yeah, swim or anything? Yeah, uh, the ones that we find in the Cambrian are all benthic, and then um, we find a lot of big, sort of bushy, benthic graptolites pretty much consistently all the way up to the Carboniferous. Um, some of them appear later on in the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, but definitely their abundance in the fossil record decreases a lot after the Carboniferous. In fact, a lot of textbooks that you'll look at that are a little older will generally tell you that graptolites went extinct in the Carboniferous. And those are the 
the, they're referring there to the range of those benthic graptolites. Starting at the Ordovician, something new develops, where we get a group called the graptoloids. The graptoloids are pelagic. They live up in the water column like fish and plankton do, like ammonites. And uh, that group first appears at the Ordovician and continues all the way into the early Devonian. So graptoloids are the main thing that you study. Mm -hmm. um, and you said they go from what's the Ordovician to the Devonian. Ordovician to the early Devonian. How long is that? That's about 80 million years. So a longer okay. duration of time than um, divides us from the non-avian dinosaurs. Okay. And you said that uh, the graptoloids were not benthic. So what were they doing? Well, they were, like I said, up in the water column. Um, what we know is that um, starting at the base of the Ordovician, we start finding these graptolite colonies that no longer have a place on the colony for attaching to the seafloor. It's pretty obvious before that point that they have these attachment points that look like rooted structures. They lose that. Um, they develop these long uh, thread-like spines called nemas instead in the place where they used to have an attachment. Um, these colonies develop basically a what is called a global distribution, meaning that we find them across all the different paleo continents that we can sample from at the time. Um, and species develop worldwide distributions. And overall, this is, gen and also we find them in really deep water sediments. Uh, black shales generally representing sort of uh, shelf of breaks. And so uh, people generally take this whole body of evidence and they say, well, they must have been up in the water column. We don't really see how they would have been swimming, and thus we would call them nectar. And so we think they must be plankton. They must have been floating around or sort of more passively moving around in the water column. And do you think they only made that transition one time, or did lots of different groups do that separately? Well, there's been debate of, about that over the years. Um, generally, evidence is looking that um, the vast majority of of planktonic graptolites all belong to a single group. There might be a few cases of a few other independent transitions, but we don't really have those nailed down too well. Um, the vast majority of planktonic graptolites all belong to a monophyletic group, and we call them the graptoloida. Okay, so the graptoloida floating around in the water column mm -hmm. in the forward division to the Vonian. What else would have been there in the water column with them, eating them, or what were they maybe eating? Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that we know actually very little about what was living in the water column along with them. I mean, we can make some inferences that, you know, there were certainly jellyfish in the water column, um, but they don't leave really a fossil record. And um, uh, there was probably a lot of phytoplankton that would have been unskeletonized, that wouldn't have had any sort of uh, mineral skeleton. So unlike the coccoliths and diatoms and forams of today, um, there were probably these soft-bodied phytoplankton. They don't know, so they don't leave much of a fossil record either. What we have is some organic walled acrotarchs, and the extent to which we can say about the phytoplankton communities of the Paleozoic from acrotarchs might be limited. Um, we know that there were conodonts, but conodonts probably had a distribution that was maybe more near shore than the graptolites, and they were probably more uh, living closer to the seafloor than the graptolites were. Um, there was a group called the Chitinozoans. They leave behind these little cup-shaped uh, fossils made out of a chitin-like material. Um, we think they're eight capsules of some sort of pelagic arthropod, but we don't really know. Um, really, the graptolites are, for the most part, the majority of what we know is going on in the water column for the interval that they're around. We know that there weren't really too many actively swimming uh, fish that would have been able to swim around with the graptolites. And the graptolites sort of go out just around the point when we start seeing really sort of diverse, actively swimming fish communities. So who knows, maybe the graptolites made really good fish food near the end of their evolutionary history. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that you find graptolites in uh, deep ocean sediments. What kind of rocks do you find in the basement? Well, that the, like? the, the classic graptolite fossil is a graptolite you find in a black shale. Um, black shales are these uh, thinly bedded uh, mudstones that are very black in color because either the water that they were in or the just where the sediments themselves were disoxic, that they were very low in oxygen, um, full of organics uh, that weren't being oxidized and um, 
the graptolites basically uh, may have been sort of contributing to that because the graptolites are organic fossils. They get preserved in these mudstones, uh, and they generally get flattened with these mudstones so that they're these uh, two-dimensional fossils. They're organic, and so they end up sort of uh, preserving as these uh, flattened silhouettes, basically. Now, they're organic fossils. Why are they organic? Well, the material that the zooids secrete in order to then construct their little tube, tube houses is actually some sort of uh, organic proteinaceous material, like collagen or chitin, although it isn't actually specifically any one of those. And this material is uh, very rubbery and durable, at least, um, but when it first comes out, when they first secrete it, it's like this very sort of amorphous material, which they sculpt into little half rings. And then they secrete additional materials that then sort of hardens it into this rubbery material. These little half rings get stacked up onto each other, and the, this um, produces a very characteristic sort of construction uh, where you end up with little zigzags on the side, where the little half rings are coming together. And uh, that's very distinctive, and that's recently allowed um, some researchers to recognize that a lot of fossils we used to think were fossil algae or fossil hydroids from the Paleozoic, that many of these are actually fossil pterodactyls, fossil graptolites. So it turns out a number of times graptoloids go from constructing colonies out of these simple tubes to instead constructing basically uh, uh, struts that then has sort of like plates inserted between the struts. Okay. And multiple times then they also construct sort of this extra fecal network of struts on the outside of the colony. And then they'll stop sort of constructing the tubular material and multiple lineages do this and they construct really weird looking colonies and uh, uh, those reticulate morphologies evolve like independently like seven times and that's that's an even weirder part that's like you know everything i'm saying is already off the rails but the, the reticulate graptoloids are even weirder do we have do you have any idea why they might be doing that uh, well no no one no one really does they were sort of used as evidence in this long-going argument about whether graptolites were really terebranchs, that this was so unlike the terebranch construction that this shows that the graptolites weren't terebranchs and that maybe they were sort of like cnidarians with sort of ciliary membranes going over these sort of networks on the outside of the colony. Um, you know, the, the zooids of the graptolite colonies actually move outside of the colony um, because they actually, it's not just tubes. <laughs> they actually, and after they put these rings down, they actually then move outside of the colony and they put down bandages on the outside to sort of reinforce the structure of the colony. And these struts actually are constructed from that bandage material. So it's more like they just become more structured in how they're putting down this bandage material down. Um, one case might be since it allows them to sort of thin those thick tubular walls is that maybe that's a way of sort of limiting how much proteinaceous material they have to put into constructing the colony. Another case is, is that, you know, like many plankton, varying how much skeletal material you have really affects your sinking speed. And so maybe it has something to do with some strategy related to that. So it sounds like they have quite a good preservation potential. Is that true? Are they common well, in the fossil record? So the material is really durable, and it doesn't seem like that many things probably are too capable of eating it. Um, what we know is, just sort of starting from the start of where this sort of preservation would begin, is um, that these things were probably sinking a good ways through the water column, uh, and then ending up on the, on the ocean floor. Um, all, you can find rock slabs just covered in them. So representing that there was sort of a good rate of these things coming down. Um, probably the reason we never find zooids in them is because the zooids had decayed by the time they got to the bottom of the seafloor. Um, the material though that the colonies themselves are constructed out of is really durable. It's really rubbery. Um, I've had samples that I've accidentally left out in vials where they've dried out and you know, you add water back into the vial and the, it doesn't look like it's experienced any sort of taconic damage. Um, I said that they get flattened in these shales. Well, I know people who have taken, you know, uh, colonies that haven't been 
had too much thermal maturity, so they haven't been cooked too much over geologic time. And taking these flattened graptolites, put a little bit of acid on the rocks in order to release the colony, and the colonies curl right up. And they end up having to put them under, uh, put them on slides under, um, between slides in order to look at them, in order to keep them from being all curled up. And that's just, you know, after hundreds of million years, the material is still that rubbery. It's still that durable. Yeah. And so this really unique sort of organic fossil, um, it does sort of have really good preservation qualities. However, we do find them mostly in black shales, which suggests that the environment that they're being preserved in also didn't have a whole lot of things to walk around and, and try chewing on a graptolite if it wanted to. We do occasionally find them in near shore sediments and uh, carbonates and siltstones that are more oxic and have other things in them, um, but they tend to be a lot rarer there, a lot less abundant. And so there's an ongoing debate about where graptolites were living with respect to the shore is ultimately more controlled by where they were actually living, their biology, or more controlled by their taphonomy. But uh, overall, the assemblage of graptolites that we get from the black shell is really well preserved, and we can get a lot of time, a lot of uh, uh, samples over a long geologic time um, with this sort of constant sedimentation of graptolites to the seafloor. In a different sort of aspect of preservation, we can also get three-dimensionally preserved graptolites. And these generally come from carbonate nodules, um, so if the, there's sort of carbonate nodules that form on the seafloor, and we can take those, we can chuck those into an acid bath and get beautiful three-dimensionally preserved graptolites out of them. And this actually is what has allowed us to say a lot of, about the manner in which graptolite colonies were constructed and thus be able to link those graptolites back to the extant terabytes. On the Earth today, uh, what kinds of places can you go out and find graptolites? Well, graptolites are basically anywhere that you can find sort of shales from the Ordovician Silurian. Uh, some of the most classic exposures are in Ireland and Wales. There are um, fantastic graptolites that come out of New Zealand and Australia, China great graptolites here in the United States, and then there are really great uh, Silurian graptolite uh, records that come out of northern Canada. Um, there's graptolites in Argentina, in South America, in northern Africa. Uh, they have a, uh, they're pretty much found on almost every continent. How big are these things? How, is it easy to find them if you went looking for them? Well, graptolite colonies can be uh, really small and actually really hard to see in the field. They, uh, they are, they're big enough that they're not considered microfossils. Um, the, uh, generally you go out and you'll look for them and um, the thing about graptolites, particularly the ones that get two-dimensionally pre preserved, is you have to kind of get the light to hit the rock just the right way in order to see the graptolites. And sometimes you can't even see many of the details unless you submerge the rock in water or alcohol. Um, and so uh, I know lots of graptolite workers will go out to a locality where they know that there are graptolites, they, they can see some of them on the rocks, and they'll just collect bags and bags of material and bring it back to the lab without having actually seen whether or not there, there are specimens on them. Okay, so a little bit tricky. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a little bit tricky. And it's the same with the carbonate nodules. If you know that the carbonate nodules might contain graptolites, you'll collect a bunch of bags of, of carbonate nodules and you won't know what's in them until you take them back to the lab and dissolve them. So we've briefly touched upon a few important kind of major events in their evolutionary history of transition into the water column and the extinction of everything except the ones that are still living. Um, are there other important things that went on? Well, yeah, so they have a really complicated sort of evolutionary history. So uh, starting at the base of the Ordovician, these uh, the bushy forms that um, we, we, uh, from a group called the dendroids go into the water column. Um, and the crazy thing is, is that going into the water column, you go from a conical form on the bottom of the seafloor to a conical form that looks basically identical but without an attachment in the water column. And so they actually did, they did about as minimal morphological changes necessary <laughs> to become plankton initially. Um, and so they start off as these, this many-branched sort of conical form and over the course of the Ordovician, they lose branches. They lose what we, uh, we call the branches stipes. 
Um, by the end of the Ordovician, the majority of the graptolites are, have basically two stipes and they're up against each other. And we refer to those as the biserial graptolites. And I think most people who've taken invert paleo probably have bad memories of these uh, double-sided saw blades that they had to identify. Yep. Um, and then um, going through the Ordovician Silurian, the um, actually only a, a small uh, restricted lineage of these biserial graptolites survives and then re-radiates out into a number of um, sort of converging on some of the biserial forms that were lost in the mass extinction and also developing a new group uh, uh, one that's composed of only a single branch, and those are called the monograptids. Um, and the monograptids become extremely diverse by the um, late, latest Silurian. They're basically the only graptolites that are left around. And some of those lineages then survive through into the early Devonian, and then finally wink out. And then that's the end of the graptolites. Now the, the benthic graptolites, um, they stick around through the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and it's not really clear what happens there. You know, maybe they moved into an environment that just isn't so well preserved in time, or what. They're definitely not around too much today. The graptolites that we do have, this, or the terebranchs that we have today, the Cephalodiscus and the Rhabdoplura, um, they're they live in pretty restricted environments, and um, they aren't as large or as notable as a lot of the fossil forms were. You mentioned earlier about um, a kind of coincident timing of fish becoming yeah, more abundant that's and the extinction. One thing. And so people said that maybe the Devonian was this nectar revolution, and so maybe there was a lot more predators and things moving around in the water column eating them. Um, it's it's really hard to say. They also had there's also a lot of things that go on that go wrong really in the Silurian. There's a, a lot of these minor extinction events that don't really influence other groups too much, but the graptolites get really hard hit and they're associated with some really gigantic carbon isotopic excursions. Um, so there were some big oceanographic changes going on that we don't understand too well, but they supposedly were having really extreme effects on the graptolite communities that were around. Um, the one mass extinction we understand really well, the later division, we have really good phylogenies that let us know that, oh, the only this one lineage survived and all these other groups went extinct. Um, and that's great since there's so much convergence then with the survivors, upon, uh, survivors onto some of the groups that went extinct. So that really muddled things up for a really long time. Um, we don't have good phylogenies for a lot of the stuff in the Silurian. We don't actually have a, a good understanding of what was going on oceanographically during a lot of those events. Um, and so there's a lot more to be learned really about what was going on in the Silurian graptolites. Um, but certainly they had decreased in diversity quite a bit before they finally went out. So I know that as well as spending a lot of your time looking at uh, graptolites, you do a lot of macroevolutionary work. Uh huh. What makes Graptoloids good for doing that? Well, um, it's always a, a chicken and egg thing in that, you know, I don't know what came first, the interest in macroevolution or the interest in graptolites, mm. but um, the, the thing that makes me really excited to work on macroevolution with graptolites is that they're an invertebrate group, they have fantastic sampling, and even though they were 400 million years ago, a lot of their uh, zones, so graptolites are really useful for stratigraphy, and so um, we generally uh, can break up the Ordovician and Silurian timescales based upon which graptolite zone, and those are in reference to particular named taxa. Well, some workers, uh, Roger Cooper and Pete Sadler, have been able to refine those graptolite zones so that we know the, the start and end dates within a few hundred thousand years. Oh, wow. And that's amazing resolution to go back to the lower Paleozoic. Um, also, they're really diverse. Um, they, like I said, they have a really well sampled record, and so we don't think we're missing too much evolutionary history. The other thing is, is that unlike a lot of invertebrate groups, they have fairly good phylogenies. Um, and they have phylogenies at the right scale for the sort of questions that I want to address. So um, there is some work done sort of comparing how much phylogenetic work there is in different groups that showed that you know some groups like cephalopods and sponges uh, and bivalves have experienced very little effort in terms of sort of understanding the, the phylogenetic relationships and trying to analyze those using um, cladistic techniques 
while other groups like arthropods and echinoderms have experienced a large amount of effort in that way. Well, graptolites, even though they don't get too much taxonomic effort, a large proportion of that is actually cladistic in nature. And it's also unlike um, some groups where maybe a lot of the focus is on understanding just relationships within a single genus, a lot of the graptolite cladistic work is to actually understand how the larger groups relate to each other and where um, particular sort of sets of genera sit within that. And that's a really useful thing that we don't have for a lot of the invertebrate groups that we have in the fossil record. We have that for a lot of vertebrate groups, but not the inverts. And so this combination of a really great sampled record and uh, phylogeny and just really interesting evolutionary dynamics, all this convergence that goes on uh, after extinction events, um, this sort of progressional trend of losing branches, etc. Um, it provides us with a lot of interesting evolutionary questions that we can use all that really well sampled fossil record and phylogenies for. So what kind of macroevolutionary work have you personally done using reptiles? Uh, well, um, some work that started when I was an undergrad actually, um, I started uh, keeping a database of um, some morphological characters that we could sort of code out for a large number of graptolites. And um, we did that um, through the sort of uh, mid to late Ordovician and into the, well into the early, the early Silurian in order to look at what the effect of the Carnantian mass extinction was on the graptolite faunas morphologically. And what we found was uh, two things. One, that even though the um, mass extinction was very uh, taxonomically selective. It was not morphologically selective because the things that survived were so similar to another group of graptolites that was completely wiped out. Um, and we were able to, to show that statistically. And that two, that there was a big boom of species diversification in the, grapto in the graptoloids following the mass extinction. And that that big boom of speciation was in fact not some sort of adaptive radiation because morphologically these were actually very similar to each other and so in fact the um, uh, average sort of amount of disparity added by each new taxon was actually really small relative to what was going on before the mass extinction. And so there was this case of high speciation and low morphological divergence, um, which I called a non-adaptive radiation in the work that me and my uh, co-authors published in the proceedings of the National Academies in 2012. So that was really interesting to be able to get at these morphological dynamics in the graptolites. Since then I've been working on um, even larger scale analyses of looking at sort of some of the uh, classic morphological features that graptolites have, like the number of branches and their orientation, in order to try to get at whether that sort of exemplifies that there might have been patterns of evolutionary constraint in the graptolites, which have long been talked about but never really been tested. And I'm also uh, continue to be interested in better refining the systematics of the graptolites, particularly in the Silurian, where we don't really have good phylogenies yet. We know that the monograptids are probably monophyletic. Um, it's never really been tested, and uh, the relationships within the, within the monograptids is, is uh, completely un not understood. So that's uh, an upcoming task for you? Yeah, um, that, that's something that that has been on the sort of future research um, for a long time since, since I was a PhD student. In terms of future research, what do you think are kind of the biggest, most important questions that you'd like to answer? Yeah, I mean, really interested in the, where the systematics of the monograptids are. There have been some analyses, but the problem is, is that they need to be really large scale and generalized across the monograptids so that we understand where groups sit within, with each other. The, the analyses that have been done have been sort of too micro scale. You know, it's that issue that exists with some of the other invertebrate groups where if we don't know how to link those phylogenies together, they don't really help us with the big picture of how the monograptids relate to each other. Um, and the issue isn't, it's not like preservation. So like the really early graptoloids, the many branched ones in the early Ordovician, we don't understand their relationships too well. Uh, there's a lot of taxa, and not a lot of them are on phylogenies because they're just poorly preserved. The monograptids, this isn't the case. We have lots and lots of three-dimensional material. And some of the work, particularly from uh, David Loydell and York Mallets, um, some of these SEM pictures of these graptoloid, colon graptoloid colonies will blow your mind, all right? Um, 
But the fact of the matter is, is that the monograptids, because they have this simplified colonial structure where they only have a single stipe, it means that we've lost a lot of the characters that we use for doing uh, cladistic analyses in, the, say, the, the diplograptids, the bicereal, a lot of the bicereal graptolites, because we can sort of use that arrangement and positioning and numbering of initial branching in order to mine that morphology basically for cladistic characters. Now, there's been some pilot work recently done that actually shows that you can sort of develop sort of a generalized character data set for the monograptids, but this is work that still needs to be done in order to get to that big picture of how the monograptids relate to each other. And I think that that's really promising because then that will allow us to say, ask, well, we see this sort of case where there's a bottleneck and then a lot of convergence of the survivors on the victims after the Hernanchian mass extinction is the same thing going on with these mass extinctions in the later Silurian. It's been proposed, but there hasn't been the phylogenetic hypothesis to test it. Other work that I've been doing more recently has been um, even bigger picture than uh, my Hermann mass extinction work, looking at morphological disparity, looking at sort of major features of graptoloid colonies, like the number of branches and their orientation, whether or not the colony has gone reticulate, uh, and uh, looking at whether this uh, smaller sort of character data set across all of the graptoloids sort of shows patterns of evolutionary constraint, which has long been proposed but never really been tested. Okay, well, it sounds like you have a lot of interesting puzzles that you'll be there, solving in the near future. Well, me and the rest of the graptolite community has uh, a lot of work to do still. All right, well, thanks very much for talking okay, about this. Okay, thank you. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin-Silverstone and Caitlin Colary, who was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.